C-3PO actor Anthony Daniels spoke to me about his struggle for Star Wars acceptance. So your I've, name wasn't on the poster for the original film? Oh no. I actually oh. had the biggest part in the film. It was everywhere, but I wasn't a part of it. Alec Guinness's alleged Jedi beef... It became clear that he, he re resented being known for an old man in a, in a dressing gown, you know. And the late Carrie Fisher's presence on the rise of Skywalker. People wanted her presence on the set of, of Nine. Me again. Just a bit of context before we get into all of that. I interviewed Anthony for BBC Radio back in September for his book release, and I occasionally do interviews for them, and they occasionally pay me. And this time I brought my own cameras along so I could bring it to you here as well, after the BBC had its way. There's a full 45-minute version of the interview on my podcast feed, Hair for Radio, with Jamie Stangroom. So please take a listen, subscribe and rate on Apple Podcasts if you can, but I will upload more video clips here as well in the coming weeks. So thank you for watching so far, and don't forget to hit the thumbs up button. Here comes the interview. Anthony Daniels. Yes. Greetings. Thank you. So we are here to talk about your new book. I am C3PO, the inside story by you, Anthony Daniels. And let me tell you, it is a book that I've not stopped reading. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, mostly because I'm lonely and have no friends. Right. And it was there for yeah. me. Yeah. However, I actually have to genuinely say it's, it is a great read. And I am a Star Wars fan, but I feel like it's it's a book that could appeal to Star Wars fans of as long as they you know, are old enough to be able to read that could appeal to Star Wars fans of all the relevant generations, but also casual and hardcore as well. I'm That's a compliment, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I hear it. And thank you. I'm, I'm kind of always a, a bit surprised about the, uh, the, the interest in the minutiae of, of filming. That It seems to me a lot of people don't quite understand the process, um, which can be absolutely wonderful and also completely mundane at, at times. So it's kind of fun putting some of those thoughts into it. How difficult was it? to write it, which makes me sound like I'm suggesting that you struggle with words. But I mean, we're talking like 40 odd years here of the Freepio story, your story with Freepio. It's a lot to cram into one book and to remember. Writing it, uh, I, I wrote it in, in pieces as things occurred. So I had various chapters, if you like, running live at the same time. And then the issue was how, well, how to knit them into a coherent uh, story. Because it is a kind of story in the end. It's a kind of journey, which I didn't realize. Um, started off in a very strange way, meeting George, going through some difficult times, going through some good times, some more difficult times. And, and then gradually I realized I was coming upwards into the light and, and so on. Not in a scary way, but um, it makes it kind of rounded. And, and I didn't expect that. So I was quite interested in that. I surprised myself in, in a small way. We'll come on to all of those times throughout the interview. I hope you brought an overnight bag. You know, we're, we're in this. Beginning, for the, uh, for I'm beginning to get scared. You're regretting your decision to, uh, to come and see me again. Well, the doors are locked. JJ um, Abrams has written the forward, and I don't, I don't want to spoil it too much just in case somebody ex exclusively wants to pick up the book for the forward. Behave yourself. There are people out there <laughs> who could behave in such a way. Honestly, Anthony, I'm one of them. He describes uh, Freepio and R2-D2 as the glue that keeps Star Wars together. And when you think about it, he's so right, isn't he? Well, George originally, uh, George Lucas originally wrote those characters as a common thread. Not, uh, and maybe, you know, glue is, is a modern interpretation of that. But like they are the breadcrumbs uh, that you think, oh, I'm, as a, a viewer, that I'm on, the, I'm on the right path here. I'm not getting lost. However many side stories, tangential moments there are. Always when you see 3PO or 2, you think, oh, yeah, Star Wars, I remember. JJ came up to me on the set one day on episode 9 and said, you should write a book. And I kind of looked at him. He said, are you? And I didn't say anything. But a few days later, I said, you know, would you write the forward? It'd be an honor. And he, he wrote a, a, a forward that just made me laugh from the moment I, I, I read the first line. But looking back, I want to go back before we return to the present day, just a couple of years uh, or so ago, and you were 24 when you went to drama school. Is that correct? Yes. This is where I'm going to demonstrate that I have actually read mm -hmm. the book. Okay, so keep congratulating me as I, as I go along. And then you graduated with a job at the BBC, the BBC Radio Drama Company. Yes. And then you moved on to theatre yes. and TV work. Yes. Before the phone rang about some weird little sci-fi film 
in 1975. And you make a decision that probably went from being just another job to changing your life forever. And I am talking about Star Wars here, by the way, Anthony. But you actually didn't particularly want to meet George Lucas, did you? No, I was I was very lucky. I was um, working in theatre in the West End. And uh, yeah, the, uh, with actors, uh, it always changes with a phone call. It's it's like it, it has to be the, the device that changes your life. I didn't want to even discuss a, a sci-fi movie because I, w- I wasn't interested in sci-fi. You know, famously, I, I, I left the theatre uh, watching 2001 A Space Odyssey because it was boring. Um Anyway, my agent made me go. And uh, George really surprised me because he was the opposite of what I thought a Hollywood film producer, director would be. George has never been Hollywood, but I didn't understand that at the time. You know, he's an independent filmmaker from San Francisco who doesn't particularly get the Hollywood system. And I was utterly surprised at this small, shy, quiet... uh, man who was very sincere but slightly un, un, unenergized but then I found out that he was seeing hundreds of people for every role in in the film and he was war- interviewing people's tough you know if you um interviewing I, I mean I'm sorry you're interviewing me I know how it feels it's tough I know stick with it it depends on the guest to be honest I guess what I've heard tough and he talked very quietly about his film. And I've told this story many times, and of course I say it in writing now. Literally, the seminal moment was seeing what I learned was called a concept painting. How a thing might look in a film if that film was ever made. A concept painting. They were all done by an artist called Ralph Macquarie. He had had a main career as being a designer with Boeing aircraft. He was used to drawing machines and so on. He had drawn a picture of this metal man that spoke so humanly to me. A connection happened. I don't know why. It was magic. Not my fault. Not... Actually, it was, I did say to Ralph Macquarie many years later, yeah, this is all your fault. And he laughed because he'd seen the film. He knew. It was a reference, a line. And then they gave me a script, to which I could not understand. If you've never... First time you read a film script, it's utterly con- con- confusing. It's not like seeing a film because somebody's knitted it all together for you at that point, the editor. So reading this stuff about, uh, you know, a scene here, a scene there, a scene back then, a point of view here, and so on. Uh, lots of stage directions um, and crazy lines. But I liked the character, the way George and his team had written him. And uh, I went back the next day and eventually said, you know, may I play the part and he said sure straight away and did you pitch that voice to him the voice or the voice. did you have to no not a, at all I, I, no. uh, one of the interesting things in uh, 2001 a space odyssey i said well you know i just remember how hal um the the red light bulb that w- was so threatening you know it was as i mentioned in the book um and you haven't mentioned my book for several minutes now so so i'm going to mention it i've got two more pages of questions Uh, um how is an early example of the dangers possibly inherent in artificial intelligence because if people haven't seen that film please just find it somewhere because it's it's terrifying but there you had um douglas rain's voice i think uh, you know you're hurting me dave this this tremendously low level threatening calm voice of a computer going completely nuts um, that stayed with me. The rest of the film didn't. I saw it years later. I was too young to enjoy it the first time. So it comes out in 1977 and it, it, it does all right, the movie, uh, uh-huh. which we now know as A New Hope. And something that surprised me in the book that you've written. Thank you. You were not in the mood particularly to celebrate the success of the film. You actually, to a certain point, resented Star Wars to begin with despite its success? I wasn't allowed to be a part of it. They um, decided, whoever, I don't know, mystery men, I think I know, um, that it would be better to keep 3PO uh, apparently as a real automata, uh, automaton, um, that 
he was an advanced piece of electronics magically created by the studios uh, and the right. production. And it would be confusing if people knew it was just some guy in bits of plastic and fiberglass and, and, and rubber and stuff. Um, nobody ever mentioned this. It, it became obvious by, by default that I was never really mentioned in any degree. And... Uh, that became really difficult to enjoy the whole thing because I wasn't there. And you actually felt uh, inferior, I guess, to your to your co-stars. Cause... Oh, I, I felt completely negated the fact that Carrie and Mark and Harrison were fated, um, and of course Sir Alec Guinness. And, y and yet I thought I was part of that team, um, but I wasn't allowed to be. And that, that, I think anybody would feel a little uh, left out, rejected, ignored, whatever. You know, you'd have to be a machine not to be hurt by that. That was a rather clever uh, way, way of putting that. It was very clever. Yeah. Thank you very much. That okay. will make the cut. We've got something. Okay. We've done well out of 14 minutes. Um, it's obvious the affection you have uh, for this character that you've had for a number of years. But when was the turning point mentally for you when you started to get what it, your role is and how you're part of it and also when I suppose did Lucasfilm change their mentality in terms of celebrating your role? The original Star Wars opening was, was kind of difficult um, because it was everywhere but I wasn't a part of it and so when they came to me you know they're going to make another thing called a sequel um, it's going to be called The Empire Strikes Back um, you know, would I be in it? And I really had to think, did I want to go to, to the physical side of it again? And also, you know, um, why would I face being trivialized again? Why would I trivialize myself by doing something in which I was being ignored after the fact? It came down to did I or did I not? And then two things happened in my brain, uh, at least. Um, it was a job. And I'm an actor, freelance actor, you know, you're meant to say yes to jobs. And secondly, I realized that I didn't want to abandon C-3PO, that kind of I was linked with him, bonded with him. He was my friend. How could I let him go? So I said yes. And um, things were better. We had uh, lovely Irvin Kirshner uh, directing, crazy, crazy, really almost like a Muppet. He was wonderful. He's, uh, you know, full of kind of crazy life uh they put my name on the poster that was nice they acknowledged so your I, name wasn't on the poster for the original film oh no i oh. actually had the biggest part in the film i had more lines yeah than anyone i didn't know that yeah that's kind of hurtful sorry so as the process went on with the empire strikes back is that when you began to feel part of it by then of course you know carrie and mark and harrison had become these international stars and i was still slightly the guy in the hot gold suit but that was okay i i had at this point made a a rational a rationalized decision to be a part of it and that and that was okay and it was uh it was you know hard work again um but again quite satisfying because it had come it was a more self-conscious self-conscious production because now it it was riding on the back of the first one nobody cared about the first one yes yeah, silly film Woo not anymore it's a big success so suddenly you are now in this mega thing where people were being more careful and possibly more respectful i think you mentioned alec guinness there and he almost had i suppose the opposite feeling in a way because he felt he was being recognized too much for star wars didn't he yes he um he gradually as time went on it became clear that he he re resented being known for an old man in a in a dressing gown, you know, because he'd done so many other more intricate things, and he didn't live long enough to come through that kind of um, dip, shall we say? I did. And what was it like working on a Star Wars film, The Rise of Skywalker, without Carrie Fisher for the first time? Carrie's Carrie's um, how would you say aura? Carrie's memory. Is, is there, and I I don't want to, I sometimes get a bit um, nervous about people uh, sanctifying somebody, you know? Carrie was lovely. Her presence on the set was, um, as we know, JJ is, is managing to use footage miraculously that he, he's borrowing from himself. I think there must be a word for that. But... Um, 
I think it was easy to her remember to remember her because, uh, of course, I'd been in the other films with uh, episodes uh, seven and eight, um, and on seven particularly, it, it was strange because I was one of the few faces that she recognised, and 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 three POs, and uh, I think that I like to think I gave her a kind of comfort because um, she was sometimes a little nervous on set. You know, she uh, found. <laughs> as I do, learning the lines difficult, they're strange lines. Um, people wanted her presence on the set of, of Nine, you know. It it felt right that <clears throat> our particular group um, within, the, as you read in the script, were, um, were, were all one as before. And I think people were, I've seen all bits of f uh, footage that really do work. And it's not in a, I have to admit, you see, I didn't like, she turned around in the second, in Rogue One, the CGI yeah, in Rogue One version. Yeah, I, I, I think that was a bit of an error of judgment because you could have recognised her from the back. Yeah, you know the buns, the, the dress, iconic buns, yeah. the iconic buns. Um, so you know, I don't like everything that I see, but I think people will be quite, uh, quite happy in a melancholy sort of way to see her in this film. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Uh, Jamie Stangrel told me to do this, because he's a ridiculous human being, which I've discovered in a matter of a few minutes.